ماشي الحال بسم الله بسم الله سيد يقرأ هذا طفل عندهم قرآن لا بسم الله بسم الله بسم الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين My dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I would like to welcome you all to another beautiful Sunday here at the Islamic Institute of America. We are gathering, uh, as we are gathering as one family, alhamdulillah, enjoying our breakfast our fellowship, and learning more about our religion, insha'Allah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil'alameen I would like to congratulate you all, my dear brothers and sisters, on the beautiful and auspicious occasion of the birth of our holy prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam which corresponded with Rabi al-Awwal 17th which was on Friday we celebrated the birth of our holy prophet <coughs> now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks often about our holy prophet and about his personal conduct and in this particular ayah, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sums up the Prophet in two words only. Our Holy Prophet had so many great qualities. He was generous. He was forgiving. He was caring. He was loving. He was humble. He was unselfish. But out of all those characteristics that he enjoyed, all those qualities that he possessed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala picks one, one description, one characteristic to describe our holy prophet with. And that is, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We have sent you but a rahma, mercy, for the whole mankind. So he's a rahma, he's a mercy. Not only for Muslims, but for all people. Not only for people, for all creations. Rahmatan lil alameen, for everything in this universe, even for animals. He was a rahma for everybody. Now, I know in Christianity, they emphasize the <clears throat> value of love. You see them talking so much about love. And it is a true, Jesus was a prophet, a messenger of love. He always preached love. And he promoted love. And he asked his followers to love one another. And you always find that concept, the concept of love, is highly promoted in Christianity. But in Islam, we see Islam focusing on mercy more than it does on love. Why is that? And what is the difference between love and mercy? We know that one of God's attributes is he is Wadud, Wadud is loving. But also, among his attributes, he is Rahim. He's merciful. And we always invoke his Rahmah, his mercy, every day, numerous times. Every time we stand up for Salah, we say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the most compassionate, the most merciful. What's the difference between love and mercy between being loving and merciful they are very close actually and <clears throat> sometimes they are even intertwined but the, the the exact difference between love and mercy is in that that love is an emotion but mercy is an action it is your love that leads you to be merciful. You're a mother, so you love your child. Your love for your child prompts you to be merciful with your child, to be compassionate. But remember, not every love leads into mercy. I have to have enough love, overflowing love to lead me into mercy. Let me give you a very simple example. If a child now, God forbid, falls down of his chair, and his mother is sitting to his right, his father is sitting to his left, which parent is most probably, more probable, there is more probability that he would jump immediately to pick that child? The mom. the mom. Does that mean, does that mean the father doesn't love the child? Of course he does. But a mother is more merciful, more compassionate, more loving. She, she expresses, she expresses her love to her child spontaneously through her action. You don't need to tell a mother to be merciful to her child. Her love would push her immediately, 
subconsciously to jump to, take, to pick up the baby, the child. But the father, though he loves his child, but he may not jump as much as the mother may do that. So mercy is an action and love is an emotion. And Islam emphasizes the action more than it does emphasize the emotion. Islam wants you, in addition of being loving, he wants you to be merciful. He wants you to translate your emotions into actions. And that was, that was our holy prophet. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes him not as loving, rather as, in fact, there is another ayah. Allah speaks about the prophet as a loving person. لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتُّمْ حَرِيصٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَؤُوفٌ رَحِيمٌ Ra'uf means someone who is loving. Ra'uf is someone who is loving. And Rahim, he is merciful. But there is much emphasis on Rahma, that he was Rahim. He was merciful. He had enough love in his heart that would prompt him to be merciful, not only toward Muslims, but toward everybody, every human, every creation on earth. Allah was, Allah talks about the Prophet as being rahmah for everybody. And I'm going to go through the subject, how he was rahmah for everybody, not only for certain individuals, not only for his family members, but for everybody. He always demonstrated the, more, the utmost rahmah and mercy that he would deserve the title of being rahmah. He himself was rahmah. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Allah doesn't say you're rahim. He says you're rahmah. You are a mercy. You are a mercy. He exhibited so much Rahmah that he gained this title, the title of Rahmah. He became Rahmah himself. So, <clears throat> when the Prophet wasallam was in Mecca preaching Islam. Now, mind you that Mecca was a very, very hostile environment, unfortunately. Very hostile. Though the Prophet was born and raised in Mecca, and he was well known in Mecca to be an honest person, a Sadiq al Amin, trustworthy. But when he started preaching Islam, Meccans were very hostile toward him. And no matter how much he speaks, he preaches, Meccans were very stubborn. The vast majority of Meccans would not budge, they would not accept his message. After, after 13 years, 13 years of preaching Islam, only a handful of people embraced this faith, only. That's why he had to leave Mecca and migrate to Medina. While preaching in Mecca, Meccans would encounter him with abuse, with ridicule, with hate. So much so that they, that they send their children often to throw stones on him and injure him. He comes home bleeding. His feet was bleeding from the, stone being, from the stones being thrown at him. And when his wife, Khadija, looks at him, he was so, she was so furious to see this honorable man, this loving husband, <clears throat> this great noble human being is being harassed and abused while he's trying to educate his people. While he's trying to wake them up, they are basically reciprocating with hate and viciousness. She would tell Rasulullah, the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, ud'u alayhim. Curse them. If you curse them, God will definitely bring his wrath on them. And instead of cursing them, 
the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam raises his hand and he says, Allahumma hdi qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamu. May God guide my people because they don't know better. He would not curse them. Rather, he would pray for them. They are abusing him and he is praying for them. Have you seen someone? Have you seen someone being abused, being harassed, and he would pray for his harasser, for his abuser? That is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet had a very tender heart, very tender heart. His tears would come down on his face whenever he hears about any tragedy, any tragedy. He would react with emotion. In a society where expressing your emotion was aib, was a big stigma, was a sign of weakness. You're not supposed to cry when you hear about a tragedy. You're not supposed to weep at all. You will be accused of being so weak and vulnerable. But in fact, reacting with emotion proves that you are a true human being. You have a soft heart. One habit, one tradition that existed among Arabs before Islam was that they would bury the female baby <clears throat> life. They would wait for a mother to give birth. If it's a boy, they cheer him. They, they are so jubilant about it. But if it's a girl, baby girl, the father would dig a hole next to his wife's bed. Whenever she delivers the baby, the baby Girl, he would, the father would take the baby, his own baby, and we would bury her alive. Not only that, they boast about that. They boast about, about burying their children alive. They consider this to be a sign of strong manhood. If you're a great man, if you're a strong man, you would bury your daughter. Why? Because she's nothing but a source of stigma for you. Bury her and get rid of her. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran speaks eloquently about this phenomena. وَإِذَا بُشِّرَ أَحَدُهُمْ بِالْأُنْثَى ضَلَّ وَجْهُهُ مُسْوَدًّا وَهُوَ كَظِيمٌ يَتَوَارَى من الغيظ من يتوارى من القوم من سوء ما بشر به أيمسكه على هون أم يدسه في التراب ألا ساء ما يحكمون When one of them is told that he got a baby girl his face turns dark and he is trying to disappear he tries to disappear from the society why? Because of the stigma. Because of the stigma, he cannot even see people anymore. يَتَوَارَى مِنَ الْقَوْمِ مِنْ سُوءِ مَا بُشْرَ And he doesn't know what to do. Should, I, should he keep this baby or he should <coughs> bury her alive? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَلَا سَاءَ مَا يَحْكُمُونَ What a terrible judgment. What a terrible mindset to bury a baby alive. The Prophet would make sure that he would show his love to our children. In fact, in fact, the Prophet was so proud of being a father to four girls. He stands up one day and he tells people, if God gives you three girls, you take care of them, you feed them, you clothe them, you educate them, and you take care of them. 
they shall become a barrier between him and Jahannam. And a man stands up and he says, what about two? What if I have two? It will have the same effect. The Prophet says, yes, وَثْنَتَانِ أَيْضًا If you have two girls and you take care of them, you feed them, you clothe them, you educate them, you show them love and mercy, this is a ticket straight to heaven. This is a ticket for you to go straight to heaven. And he always shows Muslims not to differentiate between boys and girls. In fact, he tells Muslims, Muslims, listen to me. Al-banun ni'mah wal banat hasana. Boys are a bounty, a bounty, a ni'mah. And girls are a hasana. Allah will hold you accountable for the ni'mah, for the bounty. But for the hasana, he will reward you for. So, and he says every time one of you come home from a travel, Make sure that when you distribute the gifts among your children, you begin with the girls before the boys. Because their heart is much tender. And therefore, you need to reach out to them before the boys. Delay giving your boys the gifts until you finish with the girl. This has been unheard of in that society. A society that always, always deemed women as a source of a stigma. And a society that did not even consider women to be full human beings. إِذَا مَا الْمَرْ شَبَّ لَهُ بَنَاتٌ عَصَبْنَ بِرَأْسِهِ عَنَةً وَعَارًا Their poet says, if a man has girls growing up in his home, they bring nothing but distress and stigma for him. This is the Arab poet before Islam. And the Prophet came to change all of that. You need to be proud of your children. You need to be proud of your daughter. And you should not discriminate against them simply because they, they, they are females. The Prophet وسلم, was told one day by a man who recently became a Muslim. He was Muslim in name only, not in action, not in reality. He tells the Prophet that, Ya Rasulullah, God gave me eight daughters, eight daughters, and I buried them all alive before Islam. The Prophet وسلم, had his tears running down on his cheek and he says, What can I do to you? How can I help you if there is no mercy in your heart? When your heart is nothing but a grave, when your heart is devoid of any love and mercy, what can I do to you? I cannot help you. Not even all the messengers of God can help you. When a person has no mercy whatsoever in his heart, no messenger can help you. No preacher can help you. We need to have mercy in our heart. We need to have love in our heart. Another day, the Prophet had Imam Hassan sitting on his lap, on his right lap. Hussein is sitting on the left lap. And the Prophet, once he kisses Hassan and looks at him and plays with him, and the other second he kisses Hussein, talks to him, and keeps him amused. One minute with Hassan, one minute with Hussein. One minute he kisses Hassan, one minute he kisses Hussein. A man who was sitting not too far says to the Prophet, Come on, Ya Rasulullah, that's too much. The Prophet says, what is too much? You're kissing those kids. I have kids. I never kiss them. The Prophet looks at him and he says to him, there is something wrong with you. If you're unable to show love to your children, if you fail at that level to show mercy toward, toward your own children, 
not alone strangers, your own children. There's something wrong. There ought to be something wrong with you. The prophet didn't say it, but I say it on his behalf. This man needs to see a psychiatrist. This man needs to seek some therapy. If you show no love toward your children, because if you're a true Muslim, you ought to love your children. You ought to love all children. You ought to love all people. So this is what the Prophet wasallam. he was especially sensitive toward kids, toward children. He himself says, إِذِّي لَا أَدْخُلُ فِي الصَّلَاةِ وَأُرِيدُ أَنْ أُطِيلَهَا I enter my prayer and I am intending to prolong my prayer. But I hear a child crying. And I know his mother who is praying behind me is being impatient to reach to her baby. So I accelerate my prayer. I expedite my prayer. So I don't let the mother suffer long before she was able to reach her child. I expedite my prayer so she can get to her baby and calm him down. He shortens his prayer. His prayer. And we know that the Prophet was very particular about prayer. But when he hears a baby crying, he knows that a mother hearing or seeing her child cry, crying while she's praying, she needs to rush herself to him. He expedite his prayer so she can get to the baby. In a society where, where people with psychiatric issues were deemed a curse up till now. In some Middle Eastern societies, if someone has psychiatric issues, has mental illness, they view him as someone who has been possessed by the devil. And the way to treat him is by beating him. Why they beat him? Not out of hate. In fact, they think that they are doing him a favor because he is possessed by the devil. They beat him so the devil can leave him. That's how they always treated mentally ill people. By torturing them. Thinking that they are possessed by demon. And the only way to rid them from the influence of the demons is by torturing them so the demon can leave them. The prophet showed them the opposite. There is an insane lady in Medina. She's a lady and she's insane. And she had no relatives, basically. I wouldn't say homeless, but no family. Nobody cares about her. She comes to the prophet. And she does not even address the Prophet with his appropriate title, which is Ya Rasulullah. Ya Muhammad. She calls him Ya Muhammad. Do you think the Prophet would be offended? No, not at all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. No. Ya Muhammad, I need you. What do you need? I need you tomorrow to come where I live and I have a few things to discuss with you. Now remember, he's a statesman. He is a prophet. He is responsible for millions of people. He wasn't only a citizen. He wasn't, in fact, he was not even a private citizen. He was in charge of at least one million people. He would not tell her, no, go and see my staff. He would not tell her, no, I have no time. He says, just tell me, where do you want to meet me? And I shall meet you there. And she gives him the address. And the prophet goes to her. He would sit with her on the floor. As she was talking to him. Explaining what issues she is having or suffering from. And the prophet is listening to her. Helping her out. 
A man is so merciful that even mentally troubled people would find refuge in talking to him and seeking his help because they know he is the most merciful. During one of the battles of Islam, a man by name Suhail ibn Amr was captured as a war prisoner. Suhail ibn Amr was very influential in Mecca. Why? Because he was a very eloquent speaker. Very eloquent speaker. And he would incite Meccans against the Prophet. He would give speeches against the Prophet, and basically, he would fuel people's emotion against the Prophet. He was a very influential speaker. The Prophet decided to let him go and free him, set him free. Before setting him free, one companion, Omar, came to the Prophet. And he told the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, I have a suggestion. What is it? He says, you're going to set this man free. He says, yes. He says, this man, once he goes to Mecca, what is he going to do? He will use his talent against you. He will utilize his eloquence against you. He will give sermons to rile people up against you. So the Prophet asks Omar, so what do you suggest? What do you want me to do? He says, Ya Rasulullah, make sure that before releasing him, you pull off all his teeth. So now when he speaks, makes no sense. Because if you're a speaker, and if you don't have teeth, it will not make your speech complete. It will not be clear what you're saying. So this way you will deter this man from using his talent against you. The Prophet وسلم, looks angry at Omar. And he says, Omar, are you serious? Are you serious? Inna Allah nahani anil muthlati hatta bil kalb al Allah had prohibited me from dismembering and disfiguring and torturing even a dog that has no owner, no master, not alone a human being. Are you for real? You're asking me to pull off his teeth? Because if he goes to Mecca, he will incite people against me. Against me. This is torture. This is torture. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had prohibited me from torturing anybody, even animals. One day the Prophet was told that a lady who used to be pious, apparently, she was a pious lady, but she had a cat. She locked her cat in the room for about a week. When she came, when people came to check on the cat, she was dead. The cat was dead. They told the Prophet about it. You know what, what he says? This lady will go to hell for starving this cat. She didn't feed her, nor she allowed her to go and be fed on her own. This lady will go to hell for torturing an animal, a cat. Cat, remember a cat. He's not talking about a human being, a cat. What about a human being? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us how great mercy this man was. We live now in 2019. We hear a lot about the human rights, about uh, basically animal rights. 
But at that society, that was something unheard of. A man would talk about human rights. Which right? Their national sport was to kill one another before Islam, to loot one another, to rape each other's women, to attack each other. The most horrible moment in the Arabian Peninsula was at the time of sunset. Do you know at the time of sunset, everybody's heart, especially the weak, the kids, women, their heart would start beating so fast. You know why? Because a few minutes after dark sets, Arabs start their habit, their sport, by invading each other, killing each other, looting each other. It was so rampant. Nobody could have slept one night while feeling safe at all because each tribe would use its force to basically subdue other tribes. That's how they made living. That's how they made living. You think they would make living how? That was the way they make living. A, tribe A attacks tribe B. When they, tr when they attack tribe B, they take their women as a slaves, they kill the men, and they take all their possessions. And it is theirs. So, Islam came to put an end for this merciless, senseless atrocities. Through who? Through one man. One man only. And that is Muhammad ibn Abdullah, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. In a society where kids were disrespected and treated with brutality, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam shows Muslims how to gently deal with children. Muslims had a tradition. They bring their children, while babies, to the Prophet so he would bless them. The baby would sit in the lap of the Prophet for a minute or so, and the Prophet would read something from the Quran or dua for that baby, and then the family takes the baby back. One time, they brought a baby to the Prophet as he was sitting on the Prophet's lap, the baby urinated in the lap of the Prophet. When his parents found out about their baby's action, he urinated in the lap of the Prophet. They got very rough with him, with the baby. They took him with force and they yelled at him. And the Prophet looks at them, at the parent, and he says, La tarzimu. Leave him alone. Let him finish. Let him finish. Let him finish. La tarzimu ala tifli bawla. Leave him alone. This urination could be removed and could be cleaned by water. But the injury you caused for this baby's heart cannot be cleaned. Cannot be cleaned. So leave him alone. Let him finish his job. Let him finish his business. Don't treat him rudely. This is the prophet of Islam. A child is urinating in his lap. And he takes it so easy. He smiles. And he asks his family, the baby's families, to leave him alone. Let him finish his business. Because that's not a big deal. He will go and wash his clothes. And that's it, it's over. But by being rude or rough or tough with your baby, you are dealing him a big blow. You are causing him a big scar that will stay for a long time. Don't do that. So, 
the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam is walking in the street when he passes by Fatima's house. By the way, Fatima was so special to the Prophet. Fatima was so special to the Prophet that every single day, every single day, he had to stop at her house and visit her. Every single day. The man is so busy with many responsibilities, but he makes sure in the 24 hours he has on his hand, he needs to five, even five minutes, 10 minutes, time to go to his daughter's house and check on her and visit on her. And look how respectful he was toward Fatima. When he comes to her house, he does not just open the door and enter. He recites an ayah in the Quran, ayah 33 in chapter 33. إنما يريد الله ليذهب عنكم الرجس أهل البيت ويطهركم تطهيرا Surely Allah decided to remove all impurity from you, the household of the Prophet. He recites this ayah and then he says, addressing Fatima, يا آل بيت رسول الله هل تأذنون لرسول الله بالدخول? Oh, you the household of the Prophet. Would you give permission to the Prophet of Allah to enter your house? Fatima replies from inside the house, Abata, al baytu baytuk, wal hurratu ibnatuk. It is your house, my dad. It is your house. You don't need the permission. And the lady of the house is your daughter. Please come in. Every single day, if not in the morning, then in the evening. Before he goes sleep, to sleep, he would make sure he would visit Fatima and check on her and her children. One day the Prophet was not going to her house. He was passing by her house. When he hears Hussein crying, and the Prophet stops. He was going with his companions somewhere, with the entourage. They were going somewhere. And the Prophet turns to his companion, and he says, Excuse me, give me a minute. He would go to Fatima's house. He enters the house and he says, Fatima, why Hussein is crying? Don't you know that his cry hurts me? I can't handle Hussein when he cries. I can't handle it. Don't let him cry. Please don't let him cry. To hear his grandson crying would be a moment that the Prophet could not take, could not even handle. That's how soft his heart was. That's how merciful he was. That he cannot even hear, handle the sound of a baby crying out of hunger or pain or whatever. He had to make sure to go to Fatima's house, asking her to calm the baby by either feeding him or taking care of him if he is in pain. Because that was the heart of this great man. I conclude with this story that the Prophet وسلم, was wearing an old worn out shirt. Not because he is poor, he decided to live simple. Live simple. He is the head of this estate. He has all the treasuries in his hand, but he wants to tell people that I am your president. I am your prophet, but I want to live as simple as anybody, simple in my country. So a man who was kind of wealthy, comes to the Prophet and he offers him a gift of a 12 dirham, 12 dirham. So, and he asked the Prophet, he says, Ya Rasulullah, I have a wish, and my wish is to see you buying a new set of shirt. The Prophet takes, accepts, 
By the way, the Prophet accepts hadiyya, gift. Anytime you give him a gift, he will take it. But if you give him sadaqa, he will not take it. Sadaqa has to go toward poor. He would not take it. If you give him sadaqa, he will not take it. He may take it from you and he will forward it to the poor. But if you give him a gift, he will accept it. And that's another, another beautiful gesture. Because people want to show their love to the Prophet. What do they do? They, sometimes they bring him a gift. By rejecting their gifts, he's telling them, you know what, I'm above you. You cannot reach me. He accepts the gift to make them feel happy. Not because he needs the gift. Rather, they need to give the, the gift so they feel happy. So, he gave 12 dirham to the Prophet. And he asked that the Prophet would buy a shirt. The Prophet gives 12 dirham to one of the companions. And he instructs him to go to the market, buy a nice shirt, and come back. This guy does, he goes to the market, and he brings a beautiful fancy shirt. When the Prophet looks at the fancy shirt, he says, you know, I would rather another one. I would rather wear another one. And then he tell, asked the man, do you think the man, the, the seller, is willing to take this back and give me a refund? The companion says, let me try. He goes to the seller, and he tells him that the prophet is not so happy with this shirt. Please give me my money. He takes the money back. Now, this time, the prophet himself comes to the market to make sure that the shirt he buys is of his own, basically, uh, choosing. He buys a shirt for four dirham, four dirham, not 12, four dirham, one eighth of the amount he was given. As he is walking back, a man with his shirt torn saying, Ayyuh al-Muslimun, O Muslims, there is nobody who can buy me a new shirt and I ask God to give him a shirt in heaven the Prophet takes his own shirt the brand new shirt and gives it to this man and he goes back to the store the same store and he buys another one for himself so he bought two shirts one for himself one for the other man now he has four dirham left Again, as he's walking back home, he sees a lady sitting on the corner. And young lady. And crying. The prophet approaches her. He has to approach her. And he says to her, what's wrong? Why are you crying? She says, Ya Rasulullah, my family gave me four dirham to buy some stuff from the market and I lost them and I know they will not accept you, accept my excuse they may think I stole the money the Prophet says okay here this is for Dura. take them and go back but she would not go back the Prophet says why don't you go back she says now I do have the money they will ask me what have you been for one hour I've been searching for the money so I can't tell them I lost the money. They will ask me, where have you been then? The Prophet says, fine, I will take you home. She goes with her. He walks with her. And he says to her, show me where your house is. And I am going to intercede with your family on your behalf. So they come, they both arrive, the Prophet and the lady, young lady, and the Prophet stands at the door and he casts salam. Assalamu alaikum ya ahl dar And then someone comes out and he is so surprised that this is the Prophet. Ya Rasulullah, how come you're here? I came because she was late 
This lady was late in coming back home. I came to tell you, please leave her alone and don't bother her and forgive her. The man says, of course, of course I will forgive her. Kirmalak, and for you, Ya Rasulullah, I would do anything. So upon making sure that she went back home, safe and sound, the Prophet goes back. And he looks at Imam Ali. And he says, Ali, today I got a 12 dirham. What a blessed dirhams. What a blessed dirhams. That was, that was humble. He was being humble. Is it the dirham that is so blessed? Or the Prophet himself? He could have stuck to the same shirt, the first one, the fancy one, and enjoyed it. But it was his character, his down-to-earth character that refused to use the whole money on buying one shirt for himself, rather splitting money for dirham for himself, another for dirham for shirt for another person. And with the other four dirhams, he basically saved someone's life. Had he not interfered, maybe they would have abused her. This is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma kfir lil mu'minina wal mu'minat wal muslimina wal muslimat ahya'i minhum wal amwat تابع اللهم بيننا وبينهم بالخيرات إنك قاضي الحاجات إنك مجيب الدعوات إنك على كل شيء قدير وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات نقرأ السورة المباركة الفاتحة